All right, hey, get your Bibles out if you don't already and turn to the book of James, the book of James. For those of you who are guests, you may not know this, but Arcade Church several years ago purchased a fitness center, a tennis and fitness center about a block away on, called Del Norte Fitness Center. It's got a weight room, tennis courts, pickleball courts, swimming pools, really a, a really great space for your family. We encourage you, if you have not already, to join that as well. There is a price break, I'm told, for Arcadians, uh, Arcade members, and so it, it, take advantage of that if you can, especially as the warm weather. If it ever shows up, it, you know, it would be nice to have that. Uh, when the weather is bad, like it has been the last couple of weeks, I go there to get a workout. Usually, if it's nice, I'm on my bike on the trail riding outside. But I I will go there and do stationary bike, elliptical, rowing machine, that kind of stuff, stuff that old guys do, all right? And uh, and so I I want to tell you, do you know what my favorite part about going to Del Norte is? It's leaving Del Norte. (laughs) I mean, when I'm going there for a workout, I, 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 I am not happy. I don't go skipping to Del Norte. I go there, I say, oh, man. Because I know what I'm in store for. I'm going to push my body. I'm going to purposefully stress my body, get my heart rate up, and sweat a lot, and get tired a lot, and make my muscles hurt. I'm, going to, I'm, I'm anticipating pain and discomfort for about an hour, and the best part of my day is when I'm walking out of there because I'm done with that. And what happens is that when you go and you're working out, you are stressing your body purposefully, you are testing your body continually, trying to, to make it work and, make, and create pain, all for the purpose of your ability to breathe. Breathing in and breathing out. It's as natural as anything that we can do. It's something that we do, we don't even think about. We just do this. It's out of necessity, but it's also without thought many times except when you're working out, and all of a sudden breathing becomes very, you become very conscious of your breathing. And the reason why we're talking about this is because the title of this series of the book of James is Breathing the Gospel. I'm very very glad. Whatever you hear on Sundays, more often than not, has been spoken into by our staff, and Breathing the Gospel is an idea that Beth Whitney came up. We were just talking in conversation about James, and she said, it's like Breathing the Gospel, And we said, boom, that's it. That's the title of this series. Because breathing inquires inhaling and exhaling. Breathing is not just inhaling, and then you just keep on inhaling and keep on inhaling until you can't inhale anymore, and then exhale. You don't exhale just so you can just vacate all of your lung space. It's a natural rhythm of in and out, breathing in and breathing out. I can't think of a better rhythm of the gospel than that. We breathe in the content of our faith, we breathe in the beauty and the truths of our faith, and then we breathe out the expression of our faith. We breathe out unsettled neighbors, we breathe out sack food bank, we breathe out community group, we breathe out being a neighbor in our neighborhood, we breathe out, we exhale the gospel. And so that's what we're going to be talking about for the next couple of months, we're only going to be talking about the exhale part. Because James is not all that consumed with the content of our faith. He's writing to a group of people like most of us here. He is assuming we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's assuming that we have grasped that for ourselves. And so he doesn't do a lot of teaching. He mentions Jesus only twice. My goodness, he's the half-brother of the Messiah. He only mentions him twice. He doesn't mention much about doctrine or anything. It's all about the expression, the breathing out of that. But there is this natural work that happens. We're going to be talking about that today, as well as the rest of the, of the, of the, of the weeks coming. But what it starts with, what our text this morning, beginning in James chapter 1, it starts with verse 4. Uh, it's in the, actually in the middle of verse 4. But what I want to talk about is, what, what is the win of this? What is the end product of all this? James says in chapter 1, verse 4, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Whether you are a Christian or a non-Christian, it could be that you are an atheist, you are committed to not being a Christian. 
I think that we can all share that we would love to have lives that would be defined as perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, James knows what we would be thinking, and so he qualifies this word perfect. This word perfect is not referring to purity in the sense of Jesus was pure, he was sinless. That's not what he's talking about. That's why he mentions this, completeness. In fact, in the Greek, this word perfect in this particular situation is the word that they use for period. It's something at the end of a sentence that says, what I just wrote is, is, is complete, and so now I'm starting another sentence. And so what James is saying is, there is a point in our life that can happen in our life where we are, we are periods, we are perfect and complete, and then he redefines it again and says, what I mean by complete is you lack nothing. What person wouldn't want that in their life to the point where they live out their lives, regardless of their circumstances, where they are lacking nothing? They have everything they need. Then at the end of our study passage this morning, and this will be the only time that we read it, is in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. And so these are the bookends, kind of, of the passage that we're going to study this morning. On one end, in real time, in real life, it is completeness. It is lacking nothing. But then there's this future blessing that comes to us, is that we will receive this crown of life, whatever that is. It's going to be good for those who love God. And those are bookends of stuff that goes on in the middle, and that is trials and tribulations and trouble. In between verse 4... And verse 12 is trouble. And on top of that, there's this battle for joy. The two statements I want, I, I feel compelled to prove to you today, the first one won't be, any, won't be difficult at all. I think all of us, regardless of our background, would agree with this. Struggling with trials is probable because that's the reality of life. Life is just, it's just trouble. If Young people, you need to know this. There is suffering in your future. I'm not being Eeyore to your Tigger. I'm just saying this is what's going to happen in your life. There is going to be loss. There is going to be grief. There is going to be suffering. There is going to be trouble in your life if it hasn't already happened to you. That's, that happens to Christians and non-Christians. It happens to people of all cultures, all races. It doesn't matter. It's going to happen. But the statement that I think that we have got to talk about today is this next one. Being joyful in trials is possible because that's the goodness of God. All right? So struggling with trials is probable because that's the reality of life. Being joyful in trials is possible because that's the goodness of God. I feel compelled to prove this to you today, how important this is. And what I'd like to do is I want you to think about the trial that you're in right now. Every one of us in this room is facing some form or fashion of trial or trouble. It could be something that you brought on yourself. It could be something that others brought on you. It could be work-related. It could be school-related. It could be peer or uh, relationship-related. It could be with your family. But it is a trial that you are in right now, and if you had the power, you would exit it as fast as you could. But you don't. You are smack dab in the middle of it. Now, there might be some in here And your life is going, nope, Craig, no trials. My life is rainbows, kittens, and puppies. I just want you to know, nobody wants to hang out with you. (laughs) But that could be you. It could be your life, and, and literally, there is nothing troubling you in your life right now. It could be because you are just coming off of a time of trial, and you are breathing, and you are enjoying breathing in the gospel, expressing the gospel. Or it could be that you need to buckle up because you're about ready to head into some trials. But I want you to think about that. What is the trial? And the moment I said that, it went to you. You knew exactly what's going on in your life. I want you to be thinking about that as we work through this passage in James chapter 1 and as we talk it out and see where it goes. Once again, James is writing to, it says in verse 1, the 12 tribes of the dispersion. 
The dispersion is, the, the, the historical word is diaspora. It's, it's where the Jews were scattered. And they have been scattered almost since the first day they went into captivity in Babylon. The Babylonians came and scattered them. The Assyrians came and scattered them. Then the Romans came and scattered them. And then persecution for the Christians came in at the stoning of Stephen in the book of Acts. Many of the Christians left Jerusalem and they went to uttermost parts of the earth. They were living the life, by the time that James is writing this, they were living the life of refugees. And guess what they were meeting? They were meeting walls, social walls that people had made up. They were, they were doubly hated, these Jewish Christians, doubly hated. They were hated by the Gentiles because they were Jews, and they were hated by the Jews because they were Christians. And so wherever they went, they were met with opposition simply because and only because they loved Jesus. And James is writing to them, and he's writing to you, and he's writing to me. And he's talking to us about our faith. And he's talking to us about our trials. So imagine this. You are in the first century church. It's about 45 AD. And you and your family have gone to a nearby city to avoid persecution of the Christians in Jerusalem. You fled. You've just set up house. And people now know that you're either Jewish or you're Christian. And so everybody hates you. You only, you only have your fellowship. You only have the fellowship of believers to gain strength from. And you're going through very, very difficult trials. And, and then someone says, we just got a letter from James. Our beloved pastor, James the Just, the pastor of Jerusalem. Oh, I can't wait. He will give us wisdom on how we deal with these difficult trials. I can't wait. And imagine how they must have felt when they come to verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Are you stinking kidding me? I'm supposed to put on a happy face because I'm going through hell right now? That seems awfully insensitive of James, almost flippant. Oh, just smile and you'll be okay. James gets right to it. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. I love the word count, or some of your translation says consider, all of a sudden, the first thing that James wants the church to do is think, not feel. Think. Think about your trials. In fact, I've really got a great quote by Sam Albury, who wrote a really cool um, commentary on the book of James. Some of us are reading it on staff. And this is what he says about that statement. Notice James says consider or count. He is not telling us so much how to feel as how to think. He is not saying, pretend this is fun, nor is he calling us always to have a sickly grin or stiff upper lip. That's not what James is calling us to do. He is calling us to think about these things when trust, not if trials come, but when they do come. They are inevitable. They're going to happen. If you're a person, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trials. And when they come... Do not spend all of the time in dealing with how you feel, but rather think. Think about that trial. Go beneath the surface and look and see what it has to say. There's one of my favorite Peanuts cartoons is of Charlie Brown, and, and he's, uh, uh, the, the first frame is he's, he's reading a book like this. And Lucy comes along and says, Charlie Brown, what in the world are you doing? And he says, I'm trying to read between the lines. I think that's what James wants us to do. When trials come your way, read between the lines. Think about what is going on. Think about these things. Think about your sovereign and good God who is so merciful and so loving that he can take, he has the power and the goodness and the authority to take everything that's bad going on in your life, every trial in your life, and turning it for some good purpose. He has that kind of love, that kind of power. And then in addition to that, he says in verse 3, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. You know that God is producing something in you that you always want, and that is steadfastness, strength, deeper faith. God is doing that through testing of your faith. 
Young parents, they come home from work, and, and uh, as, as they're getting dinner ready, their little five- or six-year-old girl is out in the backyard with a tennis racket and tennis ball, just hitting the ball against the garage door. And mom and dad look through the kitchen window, and they see the little girl doing that, and they're thinking, she's pretty good. She, she, she's got really good at hand-eye. What would happen if we got her some lessons at Del Norte from the tennis pros? And so they, they take her to Del Norte and they get to the tennis pro and they say, hey, we, we'd like you to teach our daughter tennis and she seems to like it, so okay. The tennis pro begins to teach the daughter the proper ways of tennis and, and he sees or she sees that, you know, she is pretty good. And so they, they, they sign her up for some, some tournaments, so give her some experience that's testing and she gets better and better, and as she gets better and better, they begin to sign her up for tournaments where they know she will not win. She'll always be playing someone who's better than her because that will be the test. That is the production of that. That is, the, that is what God is doing. When you look below the trial, whatever that trial is, when you look below, you are seeing that God is working in and through that trial to produce something in you that you have always wanted. Strength, stability, steadfastness. Think about this now. Would you want to drive over a bridge that was built by an engineer whose only exposure to engineering was that he read a book entitled Math for Dummies? Would you want to go under surgery by a surgeon whose only exposure to your particular problem is that they saw a YouTube video? No, when, when, when you drive over a bridge, you are assuming that whoever engineered that bridge went through the rigor and the stress and the testing, the very, very difficult aspects of engineering to build that bridge so it could bear your weight. When you go into surgery, you don't want to find out that the doctor saw a YouTube video on this, and so it should go okay. But rather, you want to know that that doctor has gone through testing and rigor, and they have been, they have been taken through the ringer of schedules and performing academically and performing in the surgery room to the point where that surgeon could almost do the surgery blindfolded because they know exactly what to do. That seems to be what James is saying. The reason why you and I can count joy in the midst of trials is not because the circumstances are all that great because they stink. You show up for work on Monday and guess what? They're waiting for you saying you're done. You come home from work and your teenage daughter has said, I'm done living for Jesus, I want to live for myself. Your marriage has been on the rocks for years and you're going through trial after trial and you can't seem to get it right. Your body is breaking down and all the tests show cancer and, and there's nothing you can do. Those kinds of things happen to everyone and then pile this on the fact that the people to whom James is writing, yes, those bad things are happening, but on top of that, a lot of bad things are happening purely because they're Christians. That's the only reason. If they just weren't, were less conspicuous, if they just didn't talk about Jesus, or if they weren't as good as Jesus called them to be, and they lived for Jesus under the radar, life would be so much easier for them. Or you know what? All the prosperity gospels say, if I follow Jesus, it will go well for me. I'm done, because it's not going well. That's to whom James is writing, and maybe that's you. and Maybe that's me. And let's face it, I, I think, for those of us who've been around for a while, when we, when we look back to the trajectory of our life, we look at those moments in our life where God was clearly moving and he strengthened us and we, we drew near to him. It was not during times of frivolity and pleasure, it was during times of trial and tribulation. I hope I can get this right. It's a poem. I kind of blew it in the first service. Um, it's a poem. I don't know who wrote it. Um, it's been around for a long time. I walked a mile with pleasure and she chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and narrow words said she, but oh, the things I learned from her, 
when sorrow walked with me. I think that's what James is saying to us, is in those moments of sorrow, in those moments of trial, God is producing in you the very things that you want done. And yes, the breathing becomes intense. It, it try, you're breathing in spiritually, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out at a much quicker pace because there is stress in your life and there are trials in your life, but all the while God is forging in you strength that you can never find in yourself. So in the midst of trials, ask what is really going on. But then number two, in the midst of trials, ask, what do I really need? Now, what's interesting, the very last part of verse four of chapter one, it taught, James says, you're lacking nothing. You want to be at the kind of person that lacks nothing. And then he begins verse five, if anyone lacks wisdom. The one thing that you and I may lack is wisdom. And this is, uh, speaking for myself, this is probably the one thing I would not want to admit that I lack. I can say I, I lack, I lack self-control. I lack self-discipline. I lack strength. Those are, those are good church things, and you'd kind of go, oh. But I don't think any of us would want to say I lack wisdom, because to say that, that's just a nice way of saying I tend to be foolish. And so I need, I need wisdom. And yet this is exactly what James is calling us to do. In verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generally to all without reproach. The verse doesn't get any better as it progresses. If any of you lacks wisdom, that's me. Okay, where, where do I sign up? What class, what online class do I take to get more wisdom? Who do I need to talk to to get more wisdom? Is there a book I need to read, a seminar, a workshop that I can take to get wisdom? And James says, yeah, no. Ask God. No, I think it needs to be more difficult than that. Otherwise, it won't be worthwhile because we're Americans and anything worthwhile is going to require struggle. No, no. If you lack wisdom, and you do, and I do, ask God. Yeah, I did that. I did that one time. I asked God, and he gave me wisdom, and, and he, I squandered it. I, I, he told me to zig, and I zagged. And so I don't think he's going to give that. That's why James says... Let him ask God who gives generously without reproach. Generous, excuse me, generously to all without reproach. Meaning that when you ask for wisdom, God pours out. He doesn't just say, you know, I'm going to give you a little bit and see what you do with it. And I'll give you a little bit more and a little bit more. And you be responsible for what I give you. I'm going to give you some more wisdom. No, James says, when you ask God for wisdom, he generously gives it. He pours it out. And then he says, without reproach, without finding fault. In other words, he doesn't say, hey, you know what? Uh, you're asking me for wisdom. Really cool. But you know, I gave you six months ago, you asked and I gave you wisdom and you blew it big time. So do you think I'm going to give you wisdom right now? You really think I'm going to do that and give you wisdom? When I gave you wisdom, I gave you wisdom six months ago, and you blew it. You made a wrong decision. You squandered it. And so what makes me want to give you wisdom now? No, Paul is saying, or James is saying, no, he gives it without reproach. He gives it and doesn't rub your nose in past mistakes. He doesn't give it and say, okay, one more time, and then I'm done. God, the God that we worship is this generous God. He pours out wisdom. Why? Because we ask him to. And then he does this with joy, with enthusiasm, not with what? You hear again? No, this, this is yours. I want to give this to you. And he's saying, this is, James is saying, this is what we lack. We lack this kind of wisdom. My son Scott, when it, Uh, a bunch of friends uh, want to go to a movie, and so could you give me enough movie for the ticket and maybe a bowl of popcorn? I said, sure, I, I, I've got some here, and so here's $85. That should cover the popcorn, and, and you, can, you can pay for the rest. No, I'd say, yeah, here's enough, for the here's enough for the ticket for the movie, and here's enough for uh, a bucket of popcorn, so enjoy. And I would do that. But if he's 25... 
And he comes to me and says, hey, Dad, a bunch of us are going to go to the movie, so could you give me some money for the ticket and enough for a bucket of popcorn? My response is, get a job. (laughs) Move out. Get a job because you can do this. This is not our Heavenly Father. This is not who he is. When we ask for wisdom, he gives it to us generously without reproach. So this is what wisdom looks like, kind of a quick and dirty definition. Wisdom is that awareness that a loving and generous God is present in this trial. Think about this. In the trial that you just conjured up, the the trial that you thought about when I asked you to think about that, God is present in that trial and is producing in me what I have always wanted. He is producing in me what I have always wanted. I have always wanted to be stronger in my faith. I have always wanted to have a passion for Jesus Christ. I've always wanted to abide in Christ and draw near to Christ. I've always wanted to have more of Christ. And God says, I want that too. And so I'm going to bring tests. I'm going to be trials to you that you can be able to grow stronger. I'm going to stress your breathing. I'm going to stress your spiritual life so that you can be able to enjoy what you and I have always wanted. That is wisdom when we know that God is below and in that trial and he is producing in us what we've always wanted. And he does that through trials. And boy, I'll tell you, when I, when I talk to young people who are contemplating leaving the faith, and I seem to have that conversation more and more as the years go by, I find that the reason for them leaving the faith is not intellectual. It's not because they no longer believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the reason for them leaving is not intellectual, it's social. It's I I get more joy in being with my friends who don't believe in Jesus than I do with being my friends who do believe in Jesus. I'm leaving because it's not joyful. I'm leaving because my community is no longer Christian. And I like them better than I like the community of people in Christ. I think the reason why that happens is because we have not taught them that the trials and the tribulations and the troubles that they go to are designed by God to produce in them strength and joy. And I don't mean to be Eeyore to everybody else's tigger, but I'll say this, it's not gonna get any easier to be a Christian in our culture. In fact, I believe it will be more and more difficult, and I'm not really one prone to conspiracies, but let's face it, the world and the, and the attitude of the world towards Christianity has changed drastically. We can cast blame a thousand different directions. But I believe that the trials are going to increase for us to be followers of Christ as the years go by. And so it is vital that we consider it joy, we count it joy when those trials happen because they produce in us great things. And to know that requires the wisdom from above to be able to know that God is in that trial. Well, what's the second thing, the third thing, excuse me, in the midst of trials, what is really going on? In the midst of trials, what do I really need? In the midst of trials, ask this question, what is keeping me from joy? And James mentions two obstacles. I'm gonna deal with one a little bit more in detail than the other. But there are two obstacles that keep us from joy, James says. The first one is just simply doubt. Notice what he says. We we have this incredible, this incredibly beautiful passage in verse 5, who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. And that's really great. But then James puts the word but right there in verse 6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. When you ask for wisdom, make sure that you're asking in faith and not doubting. And I don't think he's talking about intellectual faith. He's not saying, make sure you get the facts of the gospel right. What he's talking about is practical faith. In fact, he says, the person who doubts, he calls him a little bit later on the passage, a double-minded or double-souled person. 
That person that is not asking in faith is a double-minded person. They've got two minds, and those two minds are going in two opposite directions. The mental picture that I have is, maybe you'll do this this summer, but you go to Lake Tahoe, and you want to go canoeing. And so you're on the dock, and you've got one foot on the dock, and you tie off the, uh, 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 the canoe so it's, it's free in the water, and you put one foot, you know where I'm going with this, right? You put one foot in the can- canoe, and right about then is when everybody around you gets out their cell phones, because this is going to go viral. And all of a sudden, the dock isn't moving, but the canoe is, and all of a sudden it's moving further and further and further out to the point where you're doing the splits, and everyone is dying laughing. No one's going to help you because they're too busy Photoing, videoing this, and it's, th- this is a picture of a double-minded person. I want to I have my foot squarely with Jesus. I'm all for Jesus, sort of, because I want to be also all for here, too. I'm covering my bases. And it's getting wider and wider and wider and wider and wider, and, and that's why James says, that's why a double-minded person will not get what they're asking for because they're asking for God, but keeping their bases open. We find this all the time in biblical counseling. A couple comes to us, or a person comes to us, and they're they're hurting in some kind of an area, and they just come out and say, hey, just so you know, um, we really want to have biblical counseling, but we're also seeing a psychotherapist because we want to get that advice too. And we say, okay, that's fine. Is it okay if we charge you what the psychotherapist charges you? But we don't do that, we don't say that. But we say, okay, that's fine, but I'll tell you right now, somewhere along the way, as you read your Bible, the wisdom of the Bible will conflict with the wisdom of the psychotherapist. So what are you going to do then? What are you going to do then? I think we both know what you're going to do then. You're going to go to what sounds more reasonable, and man's wisdom sounds more reasonable than God's wisdom, but God's wisdom is far more practical and far more powerful But you know what? If you're doubting, that's the condition. The condition for not receiving the wisdom that you've asked for is that you're asking, but also asking with conditions. I've got this with God. I'm asking you for wisdom, God, but I've got this over here. You've got this inner mental civil war going on. And God is saying to us through his word in James 1, I will not give you what you're asking for because you're asking not in faith, but you're asking in doubt. You're a double-minded person. And a double-minded person, he says, is unstable in all his ways. He is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. A double-minded person simply goes wherever the trend or the wind of culture takes them. And they will never receive what they ultimately want, a steadfast, robust, Abiding in Christ, faith. Young people, my heart goes out to you wherever you are here because you are tempted every, every day that you go to school, you're tempted to have one foot with Jesus and one foot in the culture and you might as well just get in the canoe because you'll fall in. And you will be unstable and you will go. Guess what? You will not go where God wants you to go. You will go where the community wants you to go and it will not be towards Christ. But then the second obstacle that keeps us, that comes up against us is in verses 9 through 11, comparison. Let the, a lot of people think that, um, a lot of people think that James is kind of this ADD writer where he he, he gets on a topic and then he goes off on something else and he gets back to it. It looks like that, but what, what he's writing is on purpose. There's a reason for this. There's a reason why he can, has verses 9 through 11 where it is. Listen to these words. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of... This is, this is an example of trials and wisdom. It's a trial for a poor person to be poor, but James is saying it is a trial also for a rich person to be rich. 
You see, in our culture, in, in our culture, conventional wisdom is this. It's a trial to be poor. It's a joy to be rich. That's what our culture says. By the way, that's probably what every other culture says. It's a trial to be poor. It's a joy to be rich. The gospel switches those. And the gospel says, it is a joy to be poor, it is a trial to be rich. Because the rich, many times, are characterized as being double-minded. Their security, their stability, their faith is not in Christ, it is in their portfolio. And so it is extremely difficult for a wealthy person to truly be wise because they're double-minded. And it is also the trial for a poor person is to think in any culture, I'm of no use, I have no value, I'm worthless. And that's why James says, you need to exalt in your high position because of who you are in Christ. We're gonna talk about this some more next Sunday, so I don't wanna talk about it a whole lot, but that is many times what comes up against us in trial, is the way that the world thinks is not the way that the gospel thinks. And James says, take rich people and poor people. The gospel says to the poor person, boast in your exaltation, boast in what Christ has done for you. Boast in who he is. Boast in his forgiveness and his mercy towards you. But the rich, what are you boasting in? You're boasting in your wealth. You're boasting in your position. You actually do think that you're the smartest person in every room you walk into. You're boasting in who you are. You need to humble yourself. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand. And those of you who are poor, be exalted. Boast in your exaltation because of what Christ has done. Everything is backwards with the gospel. That's why people hate us because we're just backwards. We don't think. We see the world differently through the eyes of Christ. And so when trials come our way, we don't go, oh man, I guess my number's up. But rather we go, I know that this sovereign and good God is working in me something that I cannot work in myself. This is hard, this is difficult, but I am so grateful for his activity. How many of you have had conversations with people You've had conversations with people and they come up and say, I just, I just really wish that God would manifest his presence in my life. I wish that God would show up. I wish that God would be active in my life. The next time that happens, ask them, tell me something about your trials. What's troubling you? What are some relational issues, vocational issues, spiritual issues that, are, that you are struggling with? Well, I'm struggling with finances, or I'm struggling with my boyfriend or my girlfriend, or I'm struggling because I don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend, or I'm struggling with my marriage, or my kids, or my job. I'm struggling over these things. Is that not God's conspicuous activity in your life? Because he is deliberately producing in you something that will give him glory and be for your good. Yes, you are stressed. Yes, your breathing is in and out, in and out, in and out because you are tired and you are in pain, but you need to know that that is God's activity, his manifested presence in your life, and he's producing in you what you have always wanted. What you might lack is the wisdom to know that the wisdom to praise him so that you can think, you can consider, you can count it joy. James is a genius when it comes to writing. Of course, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he works that out. And that's why he says in verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Have you been thinking about your trial? Have you been thinking about that relational issue, that marital issue, that parenting issue, financial issue, physical issue, vocational issue, educational issue that is just really difficult? Or young people, you find out that you are the only professing Christian in the cafeteria. And the moment that you go public with your faith in Christ, you know what will happen. That's a trial. That's a test. That's a tribulation. That is God working in and through you to produce in you what you want ultimately, a stronger faith. Well, praise team, you guys can come on up and Steve, you can go ahead and move the screen. I'm gonna ask you here in a second to display that. 
I'm going to ask you here in a, in a minute or two to, to say, yeah, I've got this trouble, and I need, I need the wisdom from God to do what I need to do from God's wisdom. And so I, I, I'd like to pray. I, I want to pray with someone, or I want to pray by myself. I just, I need, I have not committed this to God. I have not been joyful in this trial. I have been angry with God. I have been so angry with him because this is in my life. You know what? Our God is so powerful and so loving, he can handle your anger. Have you told him that? Have you told him how angry you are? That in itself is a step of faith. And so Pastor Brian and the team is going to lead us in a song. And we're going to sing. And I want to just afford this time for you and to make this space for you and me to just pray and, and do what James says to ask God for wisdom and take that doubt that I'm going to keep my bases open, I'm going to keep this open and that open and I'm going to do it and, 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 and and I'm done with that. I'm going to solely trust in who God is and what he's done for me in the midst of this trial. There's a trial at school. It's a trial in my home, a trial in my marriage, a trial in my neighborhood, a trial, a trouble at my job, a trial in my soul. There's a sin that will not let go of me. It's a trial. I want to pray. And so we want to make that time for you to do that. So I encourage you just to come on down here. If you don't want anybody to bug you, you don't have to. If you want someone to pray with you, we've got elders and their wives who stand ready to pray with you and for you in this time. Because right now, that's what we need. We need wisdom. And God says, all you got to do is ask and believe that I will give it to you generously without reproach. Let's stand together. Think about this. Think about that trial. Think about that trouble. And come before your Heavenly Father. If you want to come down here, we want to make that space for you. You can do it right where you are as well. Okay? But come. Thanks for listening to the Arcade Church Podcast. Visit us at arcadechurchonline.com, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Thank you.